Hello, my name is Harry Hurston, and this is talk about uh, Senator Bill 43, New Hampshire Windham election, forensic election audit uh, we conducted in uh, May and published the report out uh, in, in mid-July. First of all, uh, we were a team, uh, myself, uh, Professor Philip Stark uh, from UC Berkeley and Mark Lindemann from uh, Verified Voting. How we were chosen was that I was appointed uh, by the Secretary of State and Attorney General of, jointly between the Secretary of State and Attorney General of New Hampshire. Uh, Mark Lindemann was appointed by uh, the Selectman of the Town of Windham. And we jointly uh, chosen the third person to be uh, Professor Philip Stark. So first of all, why we are talking about election machines at all? Uh, this is a little bit of my personal story. I started uh, vote, uh, hacking uh, election machines in summer of 2005, and I got involved by being invited by election, back then election uh, supervisor, Ion Shancho of the capital of Florida, Tallahassee. Uh, he was responsible for the widely popular, widely publicized uh, 2000, 2004 recounts, and when the Supreme Court stopped his uh, effort to find out the uh, truth, uh, what happened, uh, he felt that he needs to know more and he wasn't fully uh, appreciating the claim that voting machines cannot be hacked. So he wanted to know the truth, how the voting machines work. Uh, after the work we did in, in Florida, uh, I was participating in a number of uh, state uh, commissioned uh, voting machine studies. Uh, one of those largest ones is from 2007, Everest by uh, Secretary of State Ohio. It's a sad fact that the study we made 2007 is still valid. Uh, most of the, the same systems are still in use. Uh, very few of the, of the systems have had software upgrades and you still literally have the same software up and running which we published the vulnerabilities 2007. Uh, even the, the, uh, some vendors which have published uh, a software upgrades to their system, those software up upgrades are very seldom put in use and deployed. So we have a, the United States elections are run with a lot of very old systems. And I have been doing similar studies uh, around the world outside of the United States. I'm also a co-organizer, co-founder of the Voting Machine Hacking Wheel chair at DEF CON and also with the Election Integrity Foundation. More recently, uh, the Emmy nominate, we received an Emmy nomination for both of our, our uh, documentary movies by HBO. Back in 2006, uh, HBO documentary Hacking Democracy was the first one to light to the general audience a, the problems in voting technology. And then the new one, Kill Chain, the Cyber War on America's Elections, we received an a, a Emmy nomination on that just a few weeks ago. Our mission in, in DEF CON, uh, in a ha voting machine hacking village, is not to prove that voting machines can be hacked. Every single machine we have in a room, every single machine is in, is, uh, in use in the United States, but every single voting machine has been hacked and there are known vulnerabilities. Our mission is educational. We want people to be able to see the truth and, and experience the technology, the old technology themselves. If they have concerns about the software, if they have concerns about hardware, experience themselves, uh, how the systems actually work. There's nothing which makes me more happy than when local election officials come to hack the very machine they are using in their jurisdictions to conduct the election, and this is the first time when they are allowed to do so. So this is something where they, as the first and often last line of defense, uh, they need to have that knowledge, they need to have the experience, and so that they also understand what kind of mitigations needs to be done. When you look at the, the uh, voting systems, we have a lot of things where we can lower the, the risk by using mitigation strategies, uh, better physical uh, security, et cetera, et cetera. So our mission is to educate people. And before we started the Voting Machine Hacking Village, um, there was a very small number of uh, privileged people who had been part of these election system studies. 
uh, we have single handled the hundredfold number of people who have first hand experience in a machine by just having this room and, and having people to be able to experience the technology and, and find the truth. Now, when we go to this extremely heated uh, 2020 election, uh, I, along with uh, 59 uh, scientists and, and uh, election security experts, we sign a letter in 16th of November. Uh, where we underline that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And while we have seen a lot of claims, uh, we have been not being found a single occurrence at that time where uh, these vulnerabilities either are real or they have raised in the level of possibly changing the outcome of the election. We keep on looking every single time a new claim is coming along and we have access. We always keep uh, keep our eye on and, and want to study and white, want to research any claim uh, with the election technology. In the 2020 election, uh, like the, the audit which we are going to be talking now, there are a instances where the results were inaccurate, but like in the case of uh, the New Hampshire audit, which we're going to talk, the the inaccuracy didn't change the outcome of the election. The same people get elected even when the, there was a discrepancy in the number of votes. So we're still uh, largely behind this letter and the text, uh, but we keep on looking and, and we have to remember how long are the, the lead times from a evidence and, and be able to look into this. So we keep on looking and we keep on uh, developing a, a, a strategies to mitigate against the risks because even if the discrepancy didn't change the outcome of the election there's always a lesson to be learned to improve the election we have to improve our elections a lot a little bit about new hampshire elections uh, new hampshire is using uh, handmarked paper ballots uh, no ballot marking devices no no electronic voting Everything is done with handmarked paper ballots, which is the most secure way of voting. Uh, the, from the election purposes, the New Hampshire is organized to 320 towns and wards, and 123 of those count only by hand. Uh, New Hampshire elections in the smaller jurisdictions can count with hand without using voting machines. Larger jurisdictions require voting machines, 197 use those. And this is the, the this is normal in the United States. We every state have their own election laws. Uh, some states have very complex ballots. They, they there even the smaller jurisdictions we need to have a voting machines to to reduce the error rate. Um, but we humans we are slow and error prone, so we are not optimal counting machines for ballots. Uh, the combination should be using a voting machine, which you don't trust, and then verify the result with a mandatory risk-limiting odds. In New Hampshire, uh, there is a, they, are, they are right now, New Hampshire is, is uh, piloting with the risk-limiting audits. The process in New Hampshire is that the candidates can request a recount if they think that the result was inaccurate. And recount, recounts are very common in New Hampshire. There were 16 recounts requesting conducted uh, after the 2020 election and seven after the state primary. New Hampshire also has a safety mechanisms in place. Um, one, of the, one of the many safety mechanisms is ballot rotation, which means that the parties and the candidates appear in a different order in the ballot. So in one town, it might be Republicans all the way left and Democrat next and the other on the right. And in next town over, where it's a different ballot, it is other, other is first and then Democrats are central, etc. So those all are in the rotation. The same way if uh, there is a, a race where you have a multiple candidates per party, and in multiple jurisdictions, then the candidates are rotating. When the parties are left, uh, rotating from left to right, then the, part, the candidates are rotating from top to bottom. In this recount, hand recount, which was uh, which started this whole thing most, uh, motion, the last this was the largest numerical discrepancy between the machine count and the human count, uh, and that was a uh, 300 votes. And because New Hampshire didn't have a mechanism to 
find the explanation why there was this 300 uh, call, uh, 300 vote uh, difference that required the state legislators to take an action and pass a new law authorizing this audit, the forensic audit. So I have a typo, it's SB 43. So this was a reaction to the Rockham County District 7 contest. And that contest is a eight candidates vote for any four. Uh, that's the format. Uh, in New Hampshire, when recount is, hand recount is done, it's customary that all candidates gain more votes. And this is because people are voting uh, by filling the, the ballot inaccurately, maybe uh, circling the name or underlining the name or whatnot, making the mark in a way that the voting machine didn't recognize that as a vote. But the human looking into the voter's intent clearly understands who the vote was for. And this is the mechanism why uh, the hand counts always uh, tend to have uh, more votes uh, to all candidates. However, this time, uh, in the hand count, the, uh, each of the Republican candidates uh, gained about 300 extra votes. Uh, the three of the, of the Democratic candidates gained about 25 votes. And the, the woman who asked for a recount, she lost 99 votes. So there was a two different discrepancies. First of all, it was not clear how it's possible that in the hand count, she lost that many votes. But also 300 votes was more than the traditional in, in, in the uh, context of the, of, the exercise of the election. 300 was a high number for extra votes. The whole election was a 10,006 ballots. So that gives you size. And this audit was starting from this local down the ballot race. It had nothing to do with the presidential race. It had nothing to do with the top of the ballot tickets. This was a, a single discrepancy found in the recount in this one local race only. This is what the ballot looks like. Um, again, this may be giving a better idea of what when I say the ballot rotation changes the names of uh, the, the order of the of the political parties from left to right, and then if the same uh, uh, candidates are in multiple uh, uh, races, uh, then from top to bottom uh, rotating the name of the candidate. You also see that the uh, the names of the Democratic and Republican candidates are not on the same line. And this was on purpose. Uh, the, the, uh, the reason why this is done this way in New Hampshire was that it was a, 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 it, they want to make clear that the voters understand that the candidates are not running against each other. You can pick any four. You are not uh, bound to be making the choice between two candidates who are in the same row. So, so this uh, physical setting of the, of the candidates having the Democratic candidates one uh, row below was to try to make sure that the voters understand uh, how the ballot is constructed and, and uh, don't have the misconception that the uh, candidates would be running against each other. This is the voting machine used in New Hampshire. It's a AccuVote uh, precinct uh, optical scan machine. Uh, it's a very old model. We'll go back to that uh, in a moment, uh, the technical specifications. It is also widely used in other states. So this is, this is not uh, a, only in New Hampshire. This is widely used in, in all the states of New England. But uh, also in other ways, this have been used previously in large states like California, uh, not anymore. Widely used machine. And just because it's old doesn't mean it's bad. Uh, first of all, this machine was originally developed in 1986, and it's believed that it was first time used in elections, uh, in general election 1990. It started to be marketed in 1989, and the first election where it was believed to be used was in Minnesota. This is extraordinarily old technology. Uh, the, the CPU of that is a system on chip, it's a microcontroller version of V20, uh, it's a v neck V25. 
It's a pin compatible with the Intel 8088 and instruction compatible with the 80186. So this is the first IBM PC era technology. Uh, that chip cannot address memory more than one megabyte. That's the maximum size of a memory. This is, uh, this is really that old. In this particular uh, system, there's 256 kilobytes of RAM. That's all. This is not scanning an image of the BAL. This is a technology called optical marker recognition, which means that the scanner is looking for a landmark, called landmarks called timing marks, and finding the vote targets from the cross sections of those marks. So inside of the memory of the of the machine, there's never a picture, never an image of the of the ballot. A ballot. It only these cross sections. The scanner itself is reading 36 uh, positions per line. That's all, and the lines are separate one quarter inch from each other. So in a sense, this is a 36 pixels. Uh, for the whole side of the of, of the ballot line, um, this is uh, the scanner is using a, a laser diode, diodes, and so which are orange red in color. So on purpose, this voting machine is color blind for a color red, on on orange red. It doesn't. If you have a marking made with a red pen. Uh, and mark your vote with a red pen, the voting machine will not read it, it will not understand it. The software itself is stored in two uh, EEPROM chips, uh, 128K and 64K uh, chips. These are EEPROMs, not EEPROMs, and EEPROM means that uh, the chip can be erased only by using a intense ultraviolet light. This, the, the machine itself cannot erase the chip. Only way you can erase the chip and reprogram, you physically have to remove the chip from the voting machine, place it for 20 minutes under an intense ultraviolet light, and after it's erased, then you can use a universal programmer to write the new software into the chip. For this reason, the chips are the chips have a, a, a clear uh, mirror for the uh, ultraviolet light to reach the silicon chip. And always when the chips are programmed, uh, a, a, a piece of paper or something has been put, is put in top of, in a, in a, uh, top of the lens, preventing a accidental instability by a, a burst or ultraviolet light. Old uh, camera flashes, for example, could cause an instability. This system doesn't have any traditional operating system. This is a special purpose computer. It's not PC compatible as such. Uh, it, the whole operating system is replaced with a, a, a microkernel, and the microkernel is living on the same chips as the applications of running the election. There's a plenty of uh, empty space in, in on the chip, so how it's the actual software it's only 143 kilobytes, everything combined. This system doesn't have hard drive or any other form, a flash memory, any kind of storage which can be rewritten in, inside of the, of the system uh, to store stuff. The only place where you can store anything and where the election is living is a Epson-style J40 uh, card edge connector uh, Battery refresh uh, static RAM card. Typically, these uh, these cards are manufactured in 32, 64, and 128K, but typically only the first 32K is in use on this card. And the picture of that memory card is on the left. So this is an extremely limited single-purpose computer, where your where a attacker's surface is very small and this is not because of the sign of worrying about security this is so old that at the time when this machine was designed uh, cyber warfare was as bad science fiction this is a hallmark of how old this computer does this is even better than most of the hardened uh, systems of today just because how limited the capabilities of the system were at the time 
Here's the picture of the uh, voting machine's internals. Uh, there you see the two chips with a, a white uh, stickers. Those are the ROM chips uh, containing the software. The two chips, the left side of the, the chips in the, on, or with the white stickers, those are the, the RAM chips, 128K RAM chips, two, so 256. And the square uh, chip uh, on the side, that is the V25 microcontroller. As you can see, this is a from the era where a, a, a normal T, uh, 74 series TL uh, logic chips were used. But this is a very, very old design. Also, I would uh, like to point out that because of the limited horsepower, this, this, this machine cannot, even if you would introduce a wireless uh, a control, this doesn't have the horsepower to drive Wi-Fi, this doesn't have a horsepower to drive Bluetooth. The all, only connections this machine was uh, originally having was a RS-232 serial port with a maximum speed of uh, 96, uh, 9,600 bits per second and a modem with a maximum speed of 2,400 bits per second. But as a security measurement in New Hampshire, uh, the modem has been physically removed. Uh, the sticker uh, on the, the white sticker in, in top of the, the plastic, that's where uh, the modem was before it was removed. And also the cables uh, for the serial port has been uh, cut and removed. So in New Hampshire, this voting machine has no means of communicating with the outside world by any other means than the memory card. You can also notice uh, the uh, copper uh, color inside of the plastic. This was the way how electromagnetic uh, radiation shielding was done back those days. That is a Faraday cage, which, is, which has been done by uh, spraying the inside of the plastic case with a copper. So this, from the electromagnetic emissions point of view, this is an extremely quiet and well-shielded machine. And of course, inside of the machine, there's additional shielding for a, a, a components which might be uh, radiating more. The compartment on the left is where uh, the battery is, so this machine is intended to be able to operate uh, without a, a external power for a limited uh, limited time, so power cut wouldn't be conduct, uh, stopping the election. I would also point out an interesting thing, which we will come back later, which is that when you look the center of the of the voting machine, you see a white line on the top of the metal uh, casing. We will get back to that white line later. So this is the law which was a, uh, authorizing this audit and as you can see this is really a targeting the Rockham district set number seven which is Windham and that a race only but as yes, a measurement they are asking for recounting two other races just to make sure that whatever is, uh, is the cause of the uh, discrepancy wouldn't be affecting uh, other races, so this was a security measurement to take a, into account a uh, two wider races just in case uh, it will reveal something. And the law called us to uh, throw all, use all four machines in that county to count every single ballot. So it's a little bit different procedure than what is used in election day where the, vote, the uh, ballots were divided between four machines and then also take the, uh, the custody of the ballots, understanding how the population of used, unused ballots, et cetera, is maintained, and then hand count uh, everything. The, the hand count uh, those three races, uh, the state representative, the governor, and United States senator having a local race, statewide race, and federal race uh, in a hand count. This was the scope of the, of the uh, uh, audit. And, if, and we were we were told and authorized if we find something which expands a, a larger, we can follow the evidence wherever the evidence will lead us, uh, because the intention was to find out what caused this discrepancy, even when the discrepancy didn't change the outcome of the of the Rockham District uh, Seven race. <coughs> 
<clears throat> the first order of business was that we machine counted every single ballot. Uh, there are a number of ways you can do the machine count. Uh, you could have a uh, remove the cards from the voting machine, make a, a image of the voting machine with a third party device. Uh, we decided not to do that because the this uh, technology is arcane. So we would have needed to use a third party device which nobody else have audited. Uh, so it would have raised a concerns potentially what happened when the cards were removed and uh, from the ceiling and placed to this device. We could have used the voting machine to make a copies of the memory cards, but since we were auditing the voting machines, it would be illogical to trust the voting machine to create a forensic evidence for us when the voting machine is is in 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 doubt. Because New Hampshire had removed the cables, that was not an option. So the last thing which we which we chose to do was in order to have the best uh, possible security for and, and also make uh, gaining and regaining the public trust, we only resetted the counters of the election, pre previous election, after printing and audit tapes. And we left the cards fully sealed into the machine with no physical access. Presented the, the voting machine mode from post-election back to pre-election and ran it as it is. Uh, and also setting up the clock of the of the voting machine back to the November election day. So when we started, when we processed the paper ballots uh, with the uh, same memory cards, except that now we put all the ballots through every machine, uh, we got the results which were a, a little bit different than what was the 2020 election. And remember, at the time when we started this, we don't know which one is closer to true. Is the hand counter problem? Is the machine counter problem? Are they both wrong? We don't, we cannot, this is a, the starting point was we don't know where the, what is the source of the discrepancy? Was it the human count or is it the machine count? So first, when we ran all the ballots through, we found a, a, a plus minus two difference in 10,000 for the presidential race. We found in governor's race a 50 to 60 fewer blanks between those four machines because, again, the, all four machines had a little bit different results. The U.S. Senate, uh, the exit council, very small that changes, big uh, issues in the state representative uh, race, and then rest very small discrepancies. But these results were different than the 2020 election. So now these voting machines didn't even agree with themselves. So now we have we have to think of what has changed. We, the memory card didn't change. Um, what has changed? Why we have a different kind of results? This was the first clue for us in our journey to follow the evidence. This is as a numbers, uh, the hand counts uh, between the 2020 hand count and 21 hand count and the machine counts. Now we see that the two machine, two hand counts agree very closely to each other, which gives us a, a strong evidence that the hand count result was the wrong, the right, right result, and the machine count results were the incorrect results. So this was the first critical piece. Now we know that the that probably the main cause is not hand count, probably the main cause is the machine count being wrong and the machine is counting them different. The other part which we found immediately was that this, the voting machines, the four voting machines didn't produce exactly the same results between each other. So we had a variation of the results between the machines. We can see that two of the machines are closely matching each other one machine is a little bit off and one machine is, is way off from the others. Another interesting data point. When we look the, the, uh, uh, the other hand counts, the governor and U.S. senator, we saw that in the governor's race uh, there was a little bit more a discrepancy and the discrepancy is a, a, a non-votes being a, eliminate being lower and more votes found so about the same amount of votes were found for uh, both of the uh, governor candidates and the 
voting machine had clearly in this vote uh, say uh, failed to recognize votes when there was vote. And when we have a U.S. senator race, uh, very small differences. When I go back to the previous one, we see that the same thing was in the U.S. state representative. You have there was a thousand uh, less a, uh, a non votes for anyone. So now we are we are approaching the question: What means non vote? And a non vote can be two different things. It can be that the voter didn't vote anyone, or the voter voted too many. Because the other way non-vote can happen is called overvote condition. It means that when the, the, uh, the voter was asked to vote for four, the voter, for example, voted for five or six, and that cancels all the votes. So if you have, if, if you have a race, vote for four, and you vote for five, the result is nobody gets any votes. So this is the condition we started looking at and focusing. Maybe we are seeing what, what caused this problem. Uh, this is all 10,000 ballots superimposed over each other. This whole red blob in the left was that before we started, we made every single ballot to be unique by placing a unique number to every single ballot. We originally were planning to use a bait stamp machines, but the bait stamps uh, broke down and Eventually, that's why we just then did it with the handwriting. But this made every single ballot unique and identifiable. And after the, the, the serial number was done, we, we didn't use the, the scans of the ballots for a recount purposes. These were reference scans to be used for analysis. And we didn't know at the time when we did the reference scan how useful this will be. I want to make sure that everybody understands that if you scan ballots uh, with a separate scanner, you cannot trust those images. Uh, there are a lot of features in the scanner, scanners which have been uh, shown to alter uh, the ballots. For example, uh, the bunch hole, hole, bunch hole removal from legal documents. Bunch hole looks a lot, a lot like a filled oval. So when you have a filled oval, it can remove that. You also have to establish trust that uh, your image population is a true representation of the uh, physical ballots. So if you are creating ballot, ballot images for the purpose of, uh, for example, making a recount, then you have to do, do make extra steps to convince yourself that your image population is trustworthy. And just taking the images or hashing that, that is not nearly enough for this purpose. Anyway, in when we superimposed the images, we saw two interesting things here. You, we, you, we see a, a in a Kirsty St. Laurent, uh, I hope I pronounced her name correctly, we see a very high concentration of paper foldings going through her vote target. And we see in top of the ballot a way wider uh, area of, of foldings, um, some of them uh, being uh, over the vote targets. I have to, this, the darkness of the folding is not representing how many foldings were in that place. This is purely uh, um, maxing uh, a, a type of superimposing just to find where they are. Other interesting thing is when you look the uh, the folding on the bottom through going through the Kirstie's, uh, Christie's uh, target, you don't see in a flip side of the ballot nearly as strong marking. Uh, so that was interesting. And the last but not least, we find that the folding machine seems to be a little bit, um, or oh, the folder has seems to be a little bit uh, off center. Uh, it doesn't go straight from from the left to right. These ballots had a score line. Score line is a, a weaker than a perforation. It is a print shop created weakness on the ballot. So if, uh, and that uh, weakness is created in a safe zone. So when you hand fold the paper, you automatically fold the paper always in a safe place and it doesn't ever hit the, uh, the vote targets. So our question was, we know now that the 
folding, the correct folding line would be uh, in above the Julius Sotis uh, target. Uh, that's where the correct line is. The, the similar, the correct line is in, in uh, above the, the, uh, the candidates in, in the governor's race. So what caused a foldings to appear in an incorrect place when the, the structural weakness is, fo is forcing the hand folding to be always in a correct place? Uh, if you try to fold the paper incorrectly, hand folding incorrectly, you can not absolutely do it because the, the weakness is where the paper wants to fold and you would need a tool like a ruler to make an incorrect fold. So the plot thickens. The other part which we've started looking into the results, we found out that uh, one machine, uh, which was machine number two, processed 90% of the absentee ballots. And at the same time, that same machine had the highest error rate. So we, we had a perfect storm and coincidence where the absentee ballots which are folded are the ones which are going through a machine which have a highest error rate. Why we have a higher error rate in that one machine. The first discover we had was a paper folding machine. Uh, when the uh, good people in Windham has started to have a high number of requests for absentee ballots, they were they had a hard time to cope with the demand and someone had remembered that if they had rented a paper folding machine to be used in DMV, not in elections, used in DMV. So in order to for them to serve their voters better, they decided to use this paper, fold, paper folding machine and they use it as it is. They didn't change the settings of the scanner, of the folding machine. So it's got, it, it folded the paper exactly the same way as the DMV re-registration uh, papers had been previously folded. And at that time, nobody thought about the foldings. Uh, the uh, Secretary of State had been uh, conducted a few years earlier a testing of the foldings. Uh, if they caused the voting machine to uh, re misregister those as votes, and they ha didn't, hadn't found any problem at the time. So there was no knowledge that the folding can, be, can have a, this kind of effect. But a folding machine is strong enough that it can fold the paper in an incorrect place. So now we found out what caused the uh, folding uh, to be in an incorrect place. Again, uh, this was a, a machine which was rented by, by uh, Windham. We made a query to other jurisdictions to find out if they have been using folding machines and we couldn't find a single other township or ward which would have used the voting machine. So our uh, query was not conclusive. Uh, we didn't ask all 320, but from the sample we did and asked the question, uh, we couldn't find a another place uh, with a folding. So that's a pointing that this folding machine is a unique occurrence. It's a it's a, a, a black swan in this mix, if you may. When we look at microscope, what the folding machine looks, we we found a a unused ballots which have been folded on the election day, and the uh, the folding on the uh, right side is the folding which was done on the election day and the filing on the left was when we used the folding machine to recreate. And this is a bump and we discovered something else interesting. If the paper is folded up or down makes a huge difference. When it's up folded it creates a bump which creates a shadow and the shadow can be misinterpreted to be a marking on the ballot. While it's downfolded, it creates a bridge and it's almost invisible in the microscope that the folding was there. And this is consistent with what we saw in the superimposed image where the same strong folding which went through the Christie's uh, oval on the front side, there was not a strong folding on the flip side. And that was because the unknown factor was the direction it had been folded matters. 
And again, we couldn't reconstruct uh, with, from the Secretary of State Office whether they folded those up and down. They didn't know it makes a difference. Nobody knew it made a difference. But now we found out what is the difference. This bump is permanent in the paper, but it is not equal strength uh, over time. So at this point of time, we started looking into the bumps and we realized that why the machine count in uh, 2021 and 2020 were different. The difference was that the ballots had been laying flat six months under the wake of the other ballots and it had straightened the ballots. So you still had the bump and it still created a false readings, but it co-created less false readings because of the time the paper has been flattened under the wake. Then we started looking something else. And uh, the question was why these voting machines are uh, different from, uh, have a different result from each other. This uh, scanner cannot be opened. It's, it's, there's no easy way to uh, open it. Uh, so we used an endoscopic uh, camera to look into the, the scanner to see what was inside of, of there. And we saw a, a white powder. Well, it looked like a dust. Uh, so at the first time, we didn't even know what we were looking. Uh, I used a highly compressed air cleaner. And when we cleaned with the compressed air, a massive amount of dust, as you can see here, came out. Only later we realized that this is not paper dust. This is actually an offset printing uh, powder. In offset printing, when the ballot is printed, the ink is not fully dry when it comes out of the printing machine. And in order to prevent the ballots to stick to each other in that kind of printing technology, a, a very, very a, a fine powder is sprayed to the sheets to keep them a little bit separated and allowing them to naturally dry. So this was what we found out. It's, it's out of the printing technology. And that explained why uh, the machines were a little bit different. We conducted 32 test elections with the 16 elections uh, used by a flat paper and 16 uh, uh, elections with the folded paper. When the paper was flat, all machines, all four machines, regardless whether they had the, the paper dust or not inside, were 100% accurate. And then at the time when, the, when we processed the folded paper, the differences came out, and these differences seem to be indicating the level of paper dust contamination in I mean, offset powder dust contamination inside of the machine. So we found a contributing factor. And these are just a, we made a sanity check. Uh, we found uh, how many ballots are in each way. Uh, we found about 300, uh, 600 ballots where the folding mark goes through uh, Kirsty's target. We found a, a, uh, about four where the folding line went through uh, Mr. Sotis uh, target. We found a, a, a different combinations uh, of the foldings uh, in different uh, intensities. And this showed us that there's enough ballots. And this, this also proves us that the foldings can both add votes and subtract votes. When a voter voted for less than four candidates, uh, then if the, if the line went through uh, Christie's target, it created a phantom vote for her. And the hand count corrected, that's why she lost 99 votes in the hand count. But if a voter voted for a straight party line Republican ticket and the line went through Kirstie's, then it created in certain uh, a, a intensity a uh, overvote, which then tossed all the votes out and canceled the votes. So this folding line both explained why uh, the Republicans gained uh, 300 votes, and it also explains why Kirsty lost 99 votes in a recount. And yet another example here: we have the uh, the folding line going through the governor's race, and of course now, in if that vote is if that folding line is misinterpreted to be uh, a a 
this will be a, a vote, then it cancels those votes. And we saw that 90 uh, figure in earlier, what was the time. But these, there were not very many ballots, and not all holding lines are always interpreted as a ballot. We, when we made the sanity check, we found out that the, uh, the probability of the strong folding to be misinterpreted into a vote is 0 0.44. And it is the same with the two different ways of counting. So this is both tying our, our hypothesis to be a sane, with, regardless of which way you are analyzed. Again, this is uh, just a close-up picture to show that the external connections were really removed and destroyed, and there was no way of communicating with the memory card from outside world. Just to wrap up the last things, we did all, a lot of things. We we uh, added in addition. We uh, we looked about poll book records. We looked at absentee apl applications. We made certain that all ballots are genuine ballot printed ballots, hand marked, not printed uh, printed. We measured the, the, uh, the uh, thickness. We did a complete uh, software analysis of the EEPROMs using Gizara, uh, an NSA open source uh, a reverse engineering tool. We look through EEPROMs to find it, uh, verify that there's no uh, a unexplained data there, with, because that would be the only place where malware would be. So we complete all this analysis, and we found no evidence of uh, malware. We found no evidence of a, any kind of irregularities in the digital media, and we found no irregularities in the paper ballots. Everything was uh, authentic, printed, and handmarked. We live streamed the entire event, and we published a real-time huge amount of documents uh, all along based on the request and our, our production. So we we try to be as transparent as possible. I have spent more time to be an observer and a monitor. Uh, so I wanted to run this the way I would want to be. I would be wanting to be observer as observer. So we want to be as friendly as possible to the observers. Make sure that everything is is transparent. When we were doing the hand tallying. The spreadsheet was a Google Docs uh, spreadsheet, was a real time accessible from the world. Everybody could see all the data entry as they go. And in the video, every single ballot was a uh, with an overhead camera uh, photo. So every single ballot of the 10,006 ballot was shown in a live stream in the full HD so that everybody can follow that process. I think that's wrap it up. Uh, please ask questions in the uh, Discord and uh, I hope this was explaining why, in this case, in under very difficult circumstances, Windham elections were Windham election was run uh, very well. Uh, of course, when you have a close scrutiny, we have a recommendations how to improve it. But this was just a coincidence, a conspiracy of coincidences. Very many things needed to happen in order to create this anomaly. And now the animal is explained, and there was no malicious intent or malicious activity. Thank you very much.